the talk that I gave previously was um, based on, on published work, um, whereas the talk today is um, very new. So this is literally the, sort of the first outing um, of this new work that we're doing, looking at variability of the Indian Ocean dipole during the last millennium. Um, and so just to, to start off, um, thank you to all of the people who have supported um, this work and particularly um, funding through the Australian Research Council um, and our collaborators at the Indonesian Institute of Sciences. Right, so Indian Ocean Dipole. Um, it's probably starting to be a phrase that, that people um, are, are aware of, um, but for those who, who aren't sure what the Indian Ocean Dipole is, it's a mode of climate variability that operates across the tropical Indian Ocean. Um, if you like, it's analogous to the El Nino Southern Oscillation, but it's in the, the tropical Indian Ocean. So we define uh, the Indian Ocean Dipole um, based on the Dipole Mode Index, which takes the difference in sea surface temperature anomalies from the western um, Indian Ocean to the eastern Indian Ocean. Uh, and this map here is showing a correlation of the Dipole Mode Index um, with the spatial sea surface temperature fields. Um, and then this at the bottom is the time series of the Dipole Mode Index. Um, and so you can see, in particular, we have these very large events, um, 1994 and 1997, um, a fairly big one again in 2006. So these are so-called positive Indian Ocean Dipole events. Um, and the, it's the positive events that have had the most um, research done on them, partly because the system is skewed so that you um, can get these very extreme positive events, whereas the negative events um, seem to be sort of much milder. But during a negative, uh, sorry, a positive Indian Ocean dipole event, we have upwelling along the coast of um, Sumatra, so that we have cooler than usual sea surface temperatures here, warmer than usual um, sea surface temperatures in the, the western Indian Ocean. And now it is a, a coupled climate mode, so the reason, and one of the reasons why we're so interested in the Indian Ocean dipole is that it has knock-on effects to rainfall in the surrounding countries. Um, and so this is a correlation map for the dipole mode index with rainfall. Um, I did just realise that I probably should have flipped my, um, my correlation scale here because the green correlations here are showing where when we have a positive Indian Ocean dipole event, so cooler sea surface temperatures in the eastern Indian Ocean, uh, we have a, a strong decline in rainfall in the eastern Indian Ocean and across to um, particularly southeastern Australia whereas you have wetter conditions over in eastern Africa. So the, um, the instrumental record for the dipole mode index, um, based on um, satellite um, and blended sort of ship boy satellite records, um, we have good data from 1982 onwards. Uh, we can probably go back to 1958 um, with some of the earlier um, instrumental sea surface temperature products, but if we try and go earlier with those um, sea surface temperature products, we run into some severe problems because we are, are lacking um, data in the Indian Ocean and particularly we, um, the longer sea surface temperature data sets struggle to pick up this um, upwelling signal off the coast of Indonesia. So we need a way of going further back in time to try and kind of understand what this climate system is all about. So one of the ways that, that we've done this is to use coral records um, from the eastern and western regions of the dipole mode index um, to do a coral dipole mode index. Um, and so down on this lower plot here, the green um, records here are our instrumental um, index of um, Indian Ocean dipole activity. And then black is the reconstruction, the coral dipole mode index. And so when we published this coral dipole mode index back in 2008, um, we were able to, to use that to, to look at how often we'd had these positive um, events. So red bars are a positive event. This dark red higher bar is an extreme positive event. So I'm pointing out here um, 1994 and 1997, those strong events that you saw in the previous time series. So the, the conclusions that we came to were that there had been, over the 20th century, um, a marked increase in the activity um, of the Indian Ocean dipole. So we were having more frequent positive events. So um, we'd have events roughly every 20 years um, at the start of the, the 20th century, um, going up to a, around about a four-year recurrence interval between events um, at the, the start of the, 20th, um, the 21st century. 
um, and that we're also seeing more of these very extreme events. Uh, so that was the conclusion that we, that we made um, based on this um, around about 150 years of data. But what we would like to know is um, if we have had a longer picture of the last millennium, um, would that still hold? And are we really seeing um, something really unusual happening in the Indian Ocean now? So that's the, the question that, that we've posed. Um, is the recent increase in IOD activity unusual relative to natural variability during the last millennium? And so to do that, we're going to use these guys. So these are corals, but these are fossil corals. So rather than working underwater and drilling a coral that's living on the reef, um, we're working on these. This is a, a tsunami block, um, and then we can find other fossil corals along um, the beaches to be able to use. And I guess the, the inspiration for this work um, and, and the, the method that we're kind of following is um, based on the work that Kim Cobb has done um, for reconstructing El Nino using fossil corals from the the central um, Pacific. So the, I, I did mention before that the dipole mode index is calculated as the east-west difference. Once we go into working on fossil corals, um, we're not able to, to reconstruct um, IOD activity using that east-west difference because we'd have to have corals from both regions and be able to date them precisely so that we knew year to year that we could take a difference between them. So what we need to do is to find um, where we would go if we're just working on a single site to get the most information that we can about the Indian Ocean Dipole. So if we first of all just look at the information that we get from the western region versus the eastern region, uh, so these are those same correlation maps, um, this time just using sea surface temperature in the western box or sea surface temperature in the eastern box. Um, and so you can see that um, both boxes individually capture some of the elements of the Indian Ocean Dipole, uh, but we get much stronger correlations, um, particularly once we start looking at some of the implications for rainfall if we're working um, in this eastern box. And I'll just point out this paper by um, Gary Myers as, as well that also pointed to the upwelling that happens in this eastern area as being kind of the physical process that's really um, one of the, the key factors that you absolutely need to have an Indian Ocean Dipole, a positive Indian Ocean Dipole event. So if we then go and look at that eastern area, and we've looked at modern corals from a range of sites, um, this South Pargai area stands out as the place where if you have a coral from that um, location, you can recover information about how often positive events are happening, but also about how strong they're having. So you see these extreme events stand out um, as very strong anomalies. So that's, that's where we're working. Um, so in terms of what we have, in terms of coral material, because once you're working with fossil corals, um, you just have to work with what you can find. Um, so this is our coverage um, for the instrumental dipole mode index from 1982. With the coral dipole mode index, we go back um, to the, the mid um, 19th century. And then with the pargai corals, these blue boxes here are where we currently have data and the grey boxes here are where we have records that are being um, currently developed. And then I'll also point out um, my um, student, Bethany Ellis, has a poster um, on Thursday which is looking at um, coral records from Sunda Strait. Um, and so there, once you add in ICOADS data from the ship tracks going through Sunda Strait, you can get to having about 300 years of continuous coverage. But today I'm going to focus on this area. And so this is a first look at what those coral records look like. So we have our modern coral from the South Pargai Islands here, and then we have our um, fossil corals that we can start to, to splice together. And at the top here, I'm showing um, the, the um, thin lines show the records at a monthly resolution, and then the darker lines show a seven-year filter passing through that. Um, and to look at that interannual variability, we want to be looking at the year-to-year -year differences and get away from any influence that we might have from these decadal scale modulations. Um, and so we detrend the data by subtracting this filter, and then this is what we get. And the main thing that I wanted to point out to you is that for the majority of these fossil coral slices, we really struggle to find events that are as strong as what we've seen um, in the most recent period of time recorded by our modern coral from the same, same region. Um, and you can see that in this distribution plot. So this is just looking at the, the distribution of um, isotope anomalies in those individual records. 
So the, the grey shading here um, shows our um, distribution in the modern coral, and these are our fossil coral distributions. And you can see this tail here for the, the very extreme positive IOD events that we've seen in the recent records that we don't see in the fossil coral distribution. Right, so once we put that all together and we add in the coral dipole mode index and the instrumental record, we're covering about 460 years um, from about 1250 to present. Um, and what I'm showing here is if we take, um, so the, the shading here shows where we have identified that we've got a positive IOD event, um, and then we just do a running 30-year window counting up how many events we have in each 30-year window. So you can see where we're currently at in the modern record st does still stands out as being the most active 30-year window that we have across that 460 years of data. But there are um, natural changes um, in here. So we do have some um, prehistoric times as well where we do have high variability but not to the level that we're seeing um, in the most recent 30 years. If we go and have a look at the dipole mode index um, in the CESM1 last millennium ensemble, so 30 different um, last millennium experiments, um, we don't see that same decadal, multi-decadal modulation in IOD activity. It sort of stays very sort of constant. And so, um, so wanting to sort of delve into that sort of apparent clustering event of events that we see in the observational record a little bit more, if we, what we wanted to do was to ask the question, if we have these periods of time that are particularly active for IOD events, does that mean that if we have an event occur, that we can say something about how, when we would expect the next event to occur? Um, and so that's what this, um, these distributions are doing, um, showing the return time of events. Um, so in the, you see um, this clustering in the observational data, so even though we have an average return period of 10 years, so 46 events in 460 years, um, we have a, a natural peak around four years, but then we have these periods of time where it's very quiet and we don't have any events. Um, and that's something that we don't see in the models. Um, so just trying to sort of put some sort of um, take home on what that means for risk, um, so we've taken those distributions to say, um, if we have a positive IOD event, um, what probability do we have that we'll have, event, have another event in the next up to 50 years? And then we've compared that with just a random distribution. If we take 46, 460 years of time and we randomly distribute 46 events in there and we repeat that 10,000 times. So this is our random distribution risk and you can see that we have a heightened risk of events occurring, um, particularly in the four to 12 years after a positive event. Um, and so within sort of five years of having an event, you've got a 50% chance that you will have had um, another positive event happening. So that's something that hopefully is a take home that can be used by people who are trying to plan um, for water resource management and how you deal with the droughts and whether you expect droughts to occur. Right, so ongoing work. We're still working on um, time series. Um, we're adding strontium calcium. And we want to also have a look and see if we can say something about the negative events, not just the, the positive events. So, um, so those are the conclusions. We've got the 40, 460 years of data so far, and that's increasing. The last 30 years still stands out as unusual in terms of um, the frequency and the strength of positive IOD events. And that multi-decadal clustering that we're seeing now that we have these long records has implications for the predictability of the, these events and how we deal with, with the risk that they cause. Thank you. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, Carolyn Ammenhofer had a paper um, just a couple of months ago um, looking at multi-decadal um, oscillation of the IOD and linking that to thermocline depth and coming back to decadal variability in the Pacific. Um, so that's something that we tried to look at, um, and I glanced over it in the, um, in the, in the slides, um, at looking at the, the number of events that occur when we're in a decadal, if we look at those decadal filters, um, when we're in a cold stage of the filter as opposed to a warm phase. Now, if we do that with the coral records, um, we end up pretty much 50-50 for events happening 
when the filters say that we're in a cool or dry phase as opposed to a warm or wet phase. If we do it in the um, CESM1 simulations, we get a much clearer picture. So it's about 80% of the positive events occur when you're in a cold decade, um, as opposed to, um, yeah, 20% happening when you're in a warm decade. So I think that's something to explore a little bit more, particularly with the strontium calcium work, where we'll start to look at the temperature a bit more, but yeah. Today, I would like to introduce our new sediment record from the Central Tropical Pacific. And with this sediment record, we are making some interpretations about hydroclimate in the Central Tropical Pacific throughout the last millennium, specifically for the medieval climate anomaly and the Little Ice Age. Our study area relative to global, global rainfall, and I would like to point out uh, our study area here. So relative to global rainfall, we have two very important systems. The first is the intertropical convergence zone and, and so the El Nino Southern Oscillation. If this was, wasn't an animation stuck on the very first slide, you would notice that, because uh, it's the wet season, that the average position of the intertropical convergence zone sits just to the north, a few degrees to the north of our study site. And also, the other form of precipitation that affects our study site is the east to west oscillation between high and low precipitation of El Nino and La Nina. Both of these systems are important because they bring the fresh water, the fresh water resources to the tropical Pacific islands, especially in the central region. So what we're looking at is two big water tanks on Christmas Island, which are meant to collect any drop of rain that may fall during the rainy season. So this goes to illustrate how vulnerable these tropical islands can be to the observed and predicted impacts of climate change, which may affect how these tropical systems change, uh, how, these, how, how these tropical systems may change in the future. And investigating how these systems change in the long term, we can talk about three very broad hypotheses. The first of which is, did the, did the ITCZ migrate to the south throughout the little, through the Little Ice Age? A second hypothesis, which is related, is did the ITCZ expand during the medieval climate anomaly, or did it contract during the Little Ice Age? And a third hypothesis, which is not so much about north-south movement, but rather east to west changes, is did the, st the strength of the Pacific Walker circulation change throughout the last millennium? Well, we're going to try to address these hypotheses with a new sediment record from Christmas Island. This is the island. It is about three times the size of the island of Manhattan, which is outlined in orange. And we see the, a couple main features of, of the island, which is the main lagoon. And then in terms of water on the island, we have about 500 different lakes. And they range in from of different sizes, different depths, and geochemical properties. We collected sediment from Lake 30 which is so lovingly named um, because the other, there were 499 other ones to choose from and uh, previous work actually named this lake. So we're very grateful for that. This is a, a small brackish lake and the brackishness becomes important throughout the rest of this talk. I will move on to the data we have for this lake. This is our age model. We have seven radiocarbon dates over 120 centimeters. The core we collected was actually longer than that, but uh, there were no radiocarbon dates to be found as of yet, and um, so we were only interpreting 120 centimeters for, for this talk. Um, we have uh, our 120 centimeters goes back to about 2,000 years before present. So the lithology of this lake can be summarized with three things carbonate, gypsum, and microbial mats. So stratigraphically, we start with a unit of laminated carbonate mud, or at least portions of it are laminated. Then there's a unit of gypsum sand, more laminated carbonate mud, 
and the rest of the core, some of which it, we're not showing, is white, massive carbonate mud. Okay, so there's also microbial mats throughout uh, the top one, 120, 120 centimeters. This is an X-ray fluorescence time series showing the ratio of sulfur to calcium. And we can see that the interesting section is right here. So from 900 to about 1250 CE, the values are elevated relative to, and comparing that with the rest of the time series, they're um, much closer to zero. So I will now add our loss and ignition data. So we have the organic loss on ignition data and the carbonates, and then on top of that, the residual values. And we can see that the carbonates dramatically decrease from in this, during the same time period, and the residual dramatically increases, and these two time series mimic what we have going on with the sulfur to calcium ratios. Okay, so I'll, I'll highlight that one interesting section of the core. Um, in terms of what is going on with these, with the high sulfur values and our high residual values, well, we think they mean the same thing. And uh, what we find in, in that section is it's, it's made of gypsum. So this goes back to the orange box section of the core that um, I highlighted. Here we have sand-sized gypsum crystals and gypsum crystals found in smear slides. They're the, the, clear, the clear euhedral crystals behind the uh, organic matter. This is the same time period as the medieval climate anomaly. And looking at the rest of the time series, oops, okay, well, uh, I wanted to highlight that it, during the Little Ice Age and on towards the present, we actually see not, nothing too interesting. So our Conclusion from that is that this sediment in the modern, although there is a slight uptick, is generally like the sediment all the way back up until the beginning of the um, interesting stuff in the medieval climate anomaly. So why would we have gypsum forming in this lake for 300 years? Well, we're gonna look to other lakes on the island to try to answer this question. This is a picture of a hypersaline lake the hypersaline lakes on Christmas tend to form microbial mats and they grow along the bottom. That's why the lake looks all red. And the other, excuse me. The other thing about this lake is that it, it has gypsum actually forming in the sediment on the bottom, in the modern, the modern sediment. And we show that with a, a pie chart of LOI data, or loss on ignition data. So let's compare that to sediment from the bottom of Lake 30. This has much less gypsum forming in the modern sediment, which we would expect from the fact that this is a more, the, the one pictured is a more hypersaline lake. So how do we get gypsum forming in Lake 30? Well, we think that it must have be, been more saline, much like this lake that has the higher gypsum content. How can we test that? We performed some geochemical modeling on the lake water chemistry from Lake 30. And what we did is imposed evaporation onto the Lake 30 chemistry. So in these plots, what we're seeing is they're all uh, various repetitions of basically the same thing. Um, along the bottom, we have removal of water mass. So as we remove the water mass, we uh, simulate evaporation. We force calcite to evaporate, then aragonite and gypsum. Um, that, that is what the model came up with, not me. So, Gypsum is the third thing to show up if we force evaporation on Lake 30. And we repeated this for two different time periods under different temperature scenarios. Okay. So what does this mean in terms of the hydroclimate for the central tropical Pacific during, this, during the last millennium? At this point, I would like to say that it would, it would be wonderful to talk about all of the many sediment records that are very important in coming to conclusions uh, about the Central Tropical Pacific. Um, but for sake of time, I will instead just focus on the Central Tropical Pacific sediment records, but I would be happy to talk about them uh, with you at a later time. Um, so for our conclusions about the hydroclimate for the Central Tropical Pacific. 
I have two, a, a plot and a map. On this plot, we have latitude going from the equator to the north, and we're showing what the ITZ look, ITZZ looks like today with its maximum in the central tropical Pacific with, at about six degrees, um, its maximum amount of precipitation. So this is today. And the corresponding plan view map is showing that Christmas Island is a semi-arid place, so it's yellow colored, and that Washington Island to the north at 4.7 degrees it, um, is actually quite wet environment today as it sits under the arm of the ITCZ. Moving into the medieval climate anomaly, now what do we know? Well, we know that Christmas Island is quite dry. And we also know from the Wa Washington Lake record that, the, that Washington is not as dry as it could be, but it is drier than, it, than today. So because of that, we're suggesting that the ITCZ must have moved north so that it is north of both of these sites. Now comparing that to the Little Ice Age. For the Little Ice Age, what we know is that Christmas is not that different from today, so like a semi-arid environment. And we know that Washington is, according to Sox et al. 2009, at its driest point in the last thousand years. So we su suggest that the, that the intertropical convergence zone cannot be on top of either of these sites, but that it also probably still moves south ba based on many different references. So we suggest that it moves south, but also probably contracted to account for these two sites being on various scales of dryness. So I will conclude by saying Christmas Island Lake sediment. This record indicates a dry period during the medieval climate anomaly, and the conditions are similar to the modern from the L LIA to the present. So with the Lake Washington record, this supports northern, northward, northward movement of the Central Tropical Pacific ITCZ. This is during the MCA. And uh, also a southward shift and likely contraction during the Little Ice Age. And furthermore, we see no evidence for the ITCZ over Christmas Island during the last millennium. I will leave you with my acknowledgments. I would like to thank the, the funding sources and my colleagues. Thank you. I guess this is a perhaps an obvious question, but um, are there plans to reproduce that Lake 30 record? Um, do you see that um, sulfur calcium shift and, and the other proxies you showed? Do you see them in other lakes? This this is a good idea to reproduce the Lake 30 record, and it's certainly um, uh, something we could we could try to do. Uh, it is difficult to find a lake on Christmas that will give a sediment record that you can work with. So Lake 30 was one of those so far. And um, I think we would like to try to reproduce it, yes. But uh, immediate plans are also to try other um, proxies on Lake 30. Would you comment on the connection to temperature history for, uh, for Christmas through this period? These sure. things ought to be coupled. Sure. Well, in terms of temperature history on Christmas, so we would uh, think of comparing to coral records from the area, and uh, the nearest coral record for this time period for the medieval climate anomaly is actually from a coral in Palmyra, which is a few degrees to the north. And uh, that coral record indicates uh, uh, potentially cooler temperatures during the mid-900s. Um, so that is essentially what we have to go by in terms of evidence. Um, and then I will further say that there has been modeling and suggestions made that during this time, the, the, this part of the Pacific Ocean was in a cooler state. All right, thank you to everyone for being here, and I want to quickly acknowledge my co-authors before I begin. My postdoc advisor, Dr. Jessica Tierney, and Pedro Denezia, who's helped out with the modeling work. Um, and I'll be presenting new work on the North American monsoon. 
So usually when you think of the word monsoon, you don't immediately think about deserts, right? I certainly don't. But uh, despite those intuitions, every summer in the American Southwest and Western Mexico, these clouds roll in over the desert and provide much needed summertime rainfall. And we can visualize the importance of that monsoon to the hydrological cycle in the region um, by plotting uh, July through September rainfall as a percentage of the annual average, which is what Cook and Seeger did in this figure here. So what you can see is, uh, all right, you can see this core monsoon region, and then the fact that um, summertime rainfall provides up to 80 to 90% of rainfall in many parts of this core region. So the monsoon's critical to the hydrological cycle. And that enables a lot of human uses of water, including agriculture. And um, it enables this diverse uh, Sonoran desert flora to exist. So this is a picture I took last summer. And you can see the greening of the vegetation in response to the summertime rainfall. So the circulation is critical to regional hydrology and human and natural water uses. But we don't have a clear understanding of its past evolution. This is because many proxies from the region are sensitive to winter rainfall on long time scales. So our understanding of glacial interglacial changes in the monsoon are unclear. Um, so we wanted to see if we could develop new proxy records that are sensitive to the summertime circulation and then use those proxy records and model simulations to understand the dynamics that control the long term evolution of this monsoon. And uh, we're using two sediment cores. Um, they're marine cores with established radiocarbon-based chronologies that have been extensively studied by oceanographers. So you can see uh, monsoon rainfall rates in the background from the GPCC, and this is the core site I'll be focusing on for this talk. And for this talk, I'll be focusing on glacial interglacial changes. This is because um, the LGM represents a dramatic change in Earth's boundary conditions, right? We have continental ice sheets, changes in greenhouse gases, and changes in sea level that all drive fundamental changes in Earth's climate. So if we understand the sensitivity of the monsoon to these changes, perhaps we can better understand its fundamental dynamics. And the particular proxy we'll be looking at today are leaf waxes. And many of you may not be familiar with this proxy, but leaf waxes form the outer coating of terrestrial plant leaves, and they're synthesized by plants. Um, they're long chain hydrocarbons, and the longer chain lengths tend to be produced by higher plants. So they provide a signal of the water um, used to synthesize these waxes. Uh, they're composed of carbon and hydrogen, so we can measure the carbon isotopic composition to tell us about changes in plant functional type, and changes in the hydrogen isotopic composition to tell us about changes in past hydroclimate. This cartoon basically reveals um, a schematic of what controls the uh, isotopic composition of the hydrogen in leaf waxes. So you can think of a leaf wax as reflecting the delta D of the precipitation that it's synthesized from. We have secondary effects related to soil evaporation and transpiration, but we tend to ignore these effects as relatively small contributions. And then you have offsets related to biosynthesis and the physiology of the plant itself. And we can actually correct for these using the carbon isotopes we measure in leaf waxes. So what we ultimately get is an inferred delta D of precipitation from this proxy method. And you can see that leaf wax isotopes actually reliably reflect the rainwater delta D that they're synthesized from in this global compilation by Saxa et al. in 2012. You see a strong linear relationship between the delta D of the C29 alkane and rainwater delta D. So leaf waxes do reflect the delta D of rainfall, but then the question is what does the delta D of rainfall reflect? To tackle this question, we've actually used modern core top samples from across the Gulf of California. So these modern sediment samples um, are used to extract the leaf waxes, infer the delta D of precipitation, and analyze the modern environmental controls um, on this proxy. So we have uh, core tops from up and down the Gulf, and this is our core site shown here. Um, and you can see that there's this relatively strong gradient from more depleted values in the north to more enriched values in the south. And uh, using instrumental climate data, we've been able to relate that to the percentage of July through September rainfall that falls at each site. So what this suggests is that the leaf waxes are ultimately telling us about the importance of the monsoon in the seasonal cycle. And we performed a Bayesian regression um, 
that allows us to propagate uncertainties in this relationship back through time and applied it to down core measurements of leaf wax isotopes. I'm gonna show you the data now. Okay, so th this is our reconstruction from the two cores. This is the Holocene core and this is the LGM and deglacial portion. So what you can see is that the monsoon is a significant component of um, annual rainfall in the modern, providing up to 75 to 80% of rainfall. At the LGM, it's around 40 to 38%. So that's a dramatic change in the seasonal cycle between these two time periods. And you might ask, well, couldn't that just be because winter rainfall increased and monsoon rainfall remained constant? We did a back of the envelope calculation and to get this kind of a change, you'd actually need a five to six fold increase in winter rainfall, which might be unrealistic given the fact that the glacial atmosphere was colder and held less moisture. So we think that this reflects some signal of the weakening of the monsoon at the LGM compared to the Holocene. And the next question is why? To investigate that, we used a model. So uh, Pedro Dinesio did a lot of this work, but we're using the model CESM 1.2. And uh, you can see that it does a pretty good job of simulating the monsoon as compared to observational data over land um, and in the seasonal cycle averaged over this grid box. When we apply LGM boundary conditions to this model, you do indeed see a decrease in monsoon rainfall for July through September, and you can see this in the annual cycle as well. But we want to know why. What factors at the LGM are responsible for these changes? So we performed a series of single forcing simulations. So when you think about LGM climate changes, um, you can divide them into several distinct changes in the climate system, right? There are changes in greenhouse gases, there are changes in the ice sheets and other factors. So what we can do is we can foresee SM1.2 with only LGM values of greenhouse gases, holding all other values at pre-industrial levels to isolate the impact of that factor. So we did these single forcing simulations for greenhouse gases. One was forced with only ice sheets and then we included a brown ice sheet which um, essentially isolates the effect of ice sheet topography minus albedo. We also did a few additional simulations where we isolated the atmosphere only component of the response and then the coupled influence of the atmosphere um, and the surface ocean. And if you want further details on how those were configured, I'll, I'd be happy to talk about it afterwards. But essentially what this allows us to do is it allows us to isolate the factors that are most important in forcing monsoon changes at the LGM. Okay, so these are the results of our single forcing simulations. This is the fully coupled run. So you see this JAS um, monsoon reduction. And uh, the ice sheet only simulation is the only one that captures this. In fact, when we eliminate ice sheet albedo, um, you actually have an increase in summertime rainfall, suggesting that there's something about ice sheet albedo that's key to driving this change. Furthermore, when we look at the atmosphere only response to ice sheets, and compare it to the full LGM simulation, you see broadly the same pattern, right? You have this monsoon reduction showing up in the same overall pattern of hydroclimate change during summer. So this suggests that the atmosphere itself is key in communicating the influence of ice sheet albedo to the monsoon region. When we look at the influence of the slab ocean or the coupled influence of the atmosphere and the surface ocean, uh, you can see that the SST change actually um, reduces rainfall across this whole domain, probably as a result of cooling, but it's smaller in magnitude than the atmosphere-only driven response. Now, why is that? Well, we hypothesize that two mechanisms are responsible. The first is very simply that ice sheet albedo cools the surface. Um, and that cooling of the surface creates a, an anomalous pressure gradient that reduces the monsoon flow, which you can see here, right? There's um, strong cooling over the North American continent, uh, slight warming due to reduced convection over the monsoon region, and you actually have a decrease in the mean monsoon winds. The other factor is a little more subtle and has to do with changes in the westerlies and wind patterns over this region. So in this plot, I'm showing you um, the way the large scale flow changes the energy available for convection. So uh, when we think about um, convection, uh, atmospheric scientists and climate scientists like to summarize that as moist static energy. So it's basically the energy available for convection in a parcel of air. And it integrates information from temperature, moisture, and the geopotential height of an air parcel. So if we have less moist static energy, we have less energy to do convection, we have less rainfall. 
So what I'm showing you is the anomalous transport of moist static energy in the um, atmosphere only run with ice sheets. And what's happening is that there's less moist static energy in the monsoon domain overall. And we can do an easy decomposition um, and show that this is primarily attributable to changes in wind patterns. So these uh, westerly anomalies and northwesterly anomalies over the region actually bring in cold, dry air into the monsoon region, helping to suppress that convection. So this is a mechanism by which changes in the atmospheric circulation are directly influencing how much convection is going on in the monsoon region. Now, why is that? Well, the key link between um, the atmosphere and convection in the monsoon region seems to be changes in westerly winds. And how do you get changes in westerly winds? Well, um, here we're showing temperature anomalies in the uh, caused by changes in ice sheet albedo. So what you can see is that there's strong um, cooling over the ice sheet and a strong temperature gradient um, from the north to the south. And that meridional temperature gradient we know can help set the geopotential height gradient. And to a first order, we know that westerly winds are strongly driven by that meridia meridional gradient and flow along um, levels of geopotential. So uh, we'd expect that the westerly winds would shift south in response to changes in ice sheet albedo. And that is, in fact, what we see. Um, you have stronger westerly winds when we include um, full ice sheets in the model um, versus the pre-industrial run and versus the run um, where we only have the topography of the ice sheet. So that southward shift in westerly winds is key in driving that ventilation um, of the monsoon region. All right, so what have we learned? Well, first of all, we wanted to use the LGM to understand the fundamental dynamics that control the North American monsoon in response to glacial boundary conditions. We developed a new leaf wax-based proxy that showed evidence of glacial NAM suppression, and we showed using modern data that the leaf waxes are actually capturing the um, monsoon rainfall. And we used GCMs to elucidate two fundamental mechanisms by which ice sheet albedo um, through the mechanism of the atmosphere rather than the ocean can actually influence monsoon convection. So what this does is it ties our understanding of this particular monsoon to broader theories of monsoon dynamics that emphasize um, the surface energy balance and the way that determines the location of convection. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. Your leaf waxes are coming from terrestrial vegetation and you're yeah. getting them out of marine cores. So right. where do you think the source is for those leaves? And do you think it, you know, as the, as the climate's changing and the vegetation's going at, to, to lower elevations or, or moving around, how does that affect your results? That's actually a good question. Um, so we've sort of, when we're doing our calibration, we're only using land areas around that marine site. So we can't quite determine the source area for leaf waxes, but if we just sort of assume it's in like a two latitudinal and longitudinal band um, around the site, uh, that's an assumption that we're making. Um, I think when we're thinking about glacial interglacial changes in vegetation, um, that could influence the sensitivity of vegetation to different seasonal distributions of precipitation. But when we measured um, the carbon isotopic ratio of the leaf waxes down core, they're, they're flat. So that suggests that they're coming from the same sort of functional types of plants throughout the record. So despite the fact that pollen records from the region might show vegetation change, the leaf waxes seem to be coming from the same vegetation type um, through the LGM, and so they're probably still picking up a monsoon signal, similar to modern. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. So uh, that's actually a really good question, and I'd love to do that simulation. There is actually a paper that has done something like that where they grew the ice sheet and held albedo um, at LGM values. Um, and what you can see is that the strength of the radiative change um, it gets larger as you get higher in the atmosphere. Um, but there's still an effect when you have changed albedo at the surface. So I just expect all of these effects to be slightly weaker, but still fundamentally the same mechanism would operate. 
Sarah. Five thoughts. Yeah, so that's um, a paper that's raised a lot of questions for us. Um, I guess the best way to summarize our thinking on that is that um, in our domain, the, the isotope seems sensitive to seasonality, right? Um, the traditional interpretation in leaf waxes and in speleotherms has been the amount effect. And I actually didn't show this, but if you go farther south, um, there may be some transition zone between a seasonality dominated signal and an amount effect and a region in which the isotopes may not have that much power to pick up um, changes. So there's a lot we don't know about the systematics of isotopes in this region. Um, and it would be curious to do some further work to, to understand how those records can be synthesized. Introduction. Uh, it's nice to see you all here at my second pages meeting. And uh, as Nick mentioned, I'm going to be talking about using a new lake proxy system model to try to reconcile some model data differences that we see uh, in some key records of African climate stretching from the LGM to present. I'd like to acknowledge my, uh, my postdoc advisor, Jim Russell, and also our collaborator, Carrie Morrill, uh, who's at NOAA in uh, Boulder. So we know from climate model projections, uh, this is in particular CESM looking at the next century, that Africa is projected to warm by up to five degrees Celsius. Uh, I know this is a hydroclimate session and I would stress that uh, temperature changes really drive deep convection and set the atmosphere in motion in the tropics in particular. And so it's highly relevant for both hydroclimate prediction and for paleoclimate interpretation to consider these big temperature changes uh, which might occur. So we know that these models do a really good job simulating climate over the 20th century, but we know that there are still large uncertainties in hydroclimate projections in particular. And so we want to know if our understanding of how these uh, changes might occur in Africa is really correct. And one of the ways we can do that, as you all know, uh, at this conference is to look back at the paleoclimate record. And the last sort of um, crucial analog we have for CO2-driven temperature changes uh, over this period is the deglaciation. And so we've compiled um, a network of nine key records from lake sedimentary archives uh, in tropical Africa, four of which are plotted, the temperature anomalies here in the middle plot. And we can take a stack of these temperature anomalies, which is plotted in bright uh, on the right in the blue here. Let's see if this works. And we can then start to think about what are the major drivers of these changes since the LGM. So we can look at greenhouse gas forcing and insulation uh, and try to see uh, what's our best understanding of what drove these hydroclimate changes uh, in, in Africa. And some of the key questions we might start to ask uh, relevant for future prediction in particular is, do our climate models correctly simulate these changes on first order? And then secondly, might there be uh, geologic versus climatic controls in the changes we're seeing that are specific to the lake archive system itself and not necessarily related to the climate change? Okay, so as a first pass, we can take our, um, oops, what's going on here? There we go, sorry. We can take our, uh, our temperature stack here from those nine records, which is plotted in black, and we can uh, take the transient simulations we have available back to the LGM. So here I'm showing Love Climb, Famous, uh, and also Trace. Um, Love Climb being the, uh, the orange line here, Famous being the dark blue, and Trace being the, the light blue here. And then we can also take the PMIP time slice experiments and look at the, the changes in temperature reflected in those model simulations. What I would stress from this plot is that there's uh, large differences in the rate, timing, and magnitude in last glacial maximum to present temperature changes between the models and the data. Okay, so um, the question, as I posed earlier, is are there physical changes in the lake that might be contributing to this discrepancy, which are not necessarily the model's fault? <laughs> okay. So to do that, we're gonna use a proxy system model. We know that there are confounding impacts uh, of proxy archives that might impact our interpretation of some of these changes uh, in tropical hydroclimate. And so I'm gonna introduce you today a new proxy system model specifically for paleo lake proxies uh, that we can take the GCM simulations and couple them to this forward model to try to get a better understanding uh, of how these archives work. We can then perform much more robust data model comparison, and we can try to highlight some of the uncertainties in these reconstructions. And I'd stress to all of you today, who many of you are modelers, many of you are data gener generators, and we've 
often sort of worked apart, and we need to all come together and play in the sandbox, and proxy system modeling is a great way to do that. And I think there's a really uh, strong, crucial need for this new sort of emerging field of data model comparison. The goal for this broader project, which I'll just show you the preliminary results for today, are to look at these East African uh, lake and air temperature reconstructions as compared to what we get from the GCM simulations that are available to try to get a better handle on how African climate will change in the future. I'm going to follow the submodel proxy system model framework that was introduced by Julian this morning and created by Mike Evans. Uh, following his framework, there's an environment submodel, sensor, archive, and observation. Starting with the environment model, we know that there, um, we need a lake energy balance model to look at the temperature profiles, the mixing, uh, the water balance of the lake. So we've adapted um, from Hostetler and Bartline, 1998, and we've transferred that from Fortran to Python, making some simplifications. For example, it's designed to work on daily data. We've adapted it to work on monthly input data. And so this is, again, a hydrological and energy balance model um, which simulates changes in the lake system itself. And then we can also start to add in sensors like uh, the delta D of wax or uh, GD, GTs. Okay. So most of the um, stuff I'm going to be showing you today is really focusing on this environment model. But we will also be um, producing sensor and archive models, a full proxy system model for these lake archives. Um, we're going to be embedding some of Bronwyn Konecki's new work, uh, forward modeling delta D of waxes. Uh, there will be a different sensor model for each type of proxy. If you have one, please let me know. I'd love to incorporate it into this framework. And we'll also have um, a basic sediment compaction and bioturbation model. Uh, so the full lake system is really simulated uh, by this framework. Okay. So to run the forward model, again, I mentioned I'm using the Trace 21K experiment as well as the PMIP 3 time slice experiments. Just for an illustrative example, I'm going to be showing you the GIS, uh, the GIS output in particular. Um, one of the things we deal with a lot in data model comparison is the resolution. You can see that the coarseness of GIS sort of prevents us from really taking exactly where the lake is, but we can sort of do our best to pull those grid cells representing the climate over the lake. And with the proxy system model, some of the key questions we can ask are, can we do a good job simulating modern lake temperature profiles, so just validating the model by itself? Are lake temperatures actually recording air temperature changes? Just back to basics, what do we see in that relationship, and is that relationship stable over time? What is the variance loss? We know that this is sort of a fuzzy filter. What's the lake system doing to that input temperature signal? And what might be the role of seasonality and mixing on our interpretation of these archives? So I'm going to step through each of these questions one by one. So first, looking at just the lake model validation. Um, this is showing the, uh, the output just for a single year, the seasonal cycle uh, of uh, sort of temperature versus water depth over a single year, and also some observations from Lake Tanganyika. Um, take my word for it that these lighter colors sort of match these lighter colors over here. And uh, we see the similar structure in the seasonal cycle. Uh, sans probably a little bit um, of disagreement at depth. We don't get the same heterogeneity at depth as the observations would imply. We can then look at the LGM time slice. Again, we get a similar seasonal cycle pattern. We can look uh, for the full 100-year time slice and look at how that evolves um, during the LGM. But importantly, just in terms of model validation, again, we're seeing about a change um, of three degrees Celsius in the surface waters in Lake Tanganyika from the LGM to present, which would agree with our temperature stack values. Okay, so then we might want to ask, how does the observed warming rate in Lake Tanganyika compare to what our lake model is simulating? And so here's for the, the historical run for GIS, uh, running from 1950 to 2005. You can see the seasonal cycle in the water temperatures of the surface. We see about a 0.75 degree Celsius increase at um, different water depth levels. We can pull a transect at multiple depths. That's the nice thing about these forward models. We can really dive in and look at the temperature change at every depth in the water column. And the warming we see uh, at different left, uh, sorry, different depth scales is consistent with a number of recent publications of warming in Lake Tanganyika. As I mentioned, we know that the air temperatures are not going to exactly match the lake temperatures. Um, there's a lag in the lake system as it absorbs radiative energy. And so here I'm showing the lake, 
temperatures as they evolve during a seasonal cycle over time in the historical simulation as well as the air temperatures. We do lose variance just by virtue of the fact that the lake, again, is sort of uh, drawing in this energy over time. If we're looking at time scales greater than 10 years at a time, this isn't that big of a deal, but we do know that there is damping of the input temperature signal that's being imparted by the lake. So looking more at that difference between the air temperature and the lake temperature, uh, if we look at the differences between the air temperature and lake temperature at two different time slice experiments, what we see is that the difference between the air temperature and the lake temperature is about a degree different in the LGM versus the historical simulation. Okay, so the difference between air temperature and lake temperature changes over time. And furthermore, we know that the, um, the absolute difference between the LGM that we see in the modeled air temperatures versus the lake temperatures is about a degree difference, with the lake damping that temperature signal. Okay, so when we have, if we have a, you know, 4.5 degrees Celsius change in those air temperatures, again, we're going to see a reduction um, in the absolute changes in the, in the temperature of the lake. The take home message here is I think we have to be careful about interpreting absolute temperature changes in these archives because those relationships might not necessarily hold exactly through time. Okay, so one contributing factor to that might be changes in the mixed layer depth. So we can also simulate changes in the mixed layer depth uh, in this proxy system model. What I'm showing here on the left are the, um, the seasonal cycle averages for the uh, PI and historical simulations with GIS, as well as the mid-Holocene and green, and then the LGM. And what sticks out immediately is that the mixed layer depths are much, much uh, deeper during the LGM, which would make sense based on our physical understanding of how these lakes uh, mix. Uh, here I'm plotting those as box plots, just very basically uh, looking at the range in mixed layer depths in the historical simulation versus the LGM. So this is really important because we know that a lot of our temperature proxies rely on that mixed layer depth. And if these proxies are migrating up and down in the water column, we have to account for the fact that they're moving up and down through different temperature regimes as well as moving through uh, temperature forcing of the lake itself. So we have the temperature change and superimposed with that the mixed layer depth change. And this has been pointed out recently uh, by Kramer et al. in 2015 looking at the TEX-86 and the migration of the suboxic zone, suboxic zone in Lake Tanganyika. And so all of that just to say that this proxy system modeling framework gives us a way to really dive into um, diagnosing how these uncertainties might affect our interpretations of these data. A second question might be how does seasonality impact our, um, our maybe model data discrepancies? Here I'm showing the reconstructions from Malawi and Tanganyika of temperature since the LGM, and then the trace um, annual decadal average temperatures in the same region. Again, as I mentioned before, they look very different in terms of magnitude of temperature change. However, uh, Tierney and Russell and others have suggested that there's a maximum uptake of heat by these lake systems in, in uh, SON and JJA, so in different seasons. And so what I did is I took the seasonal decadal averages from the trace, um, the trace run and recompared the data and the models to try to get at the discrepancy, looking just at seasonality. And sure enough, when we do that, we see that there's much better agreement between the temperature reconstructions and the trace runs for SON and to some degree to JJ across the deglaciation. And so um, we can really use, again, this framework to diagnose our, um, our, the impacts of things like seasonality and mixing uh, on, these, on these records. I hope that we can use this framework to, again, combine uh, our model simulations and our observations uh, of temperature history since the LGM in a, a formal framework. Okay, so the proxy system model gives us sort of a standardized way to compare models and data and extract the maximum amount of information that's available from both. And so the next step here uh, is to try to build a fully um, a fully capable with bioturbation, sedimentation, everything model and put it uh, into PRISM 2.0. So we have proxy system models available for these uh, archives listed and uh, we're working on one for lake sediments and marine sediments as well. So stay tuned. And um, some of the climate questions we might be able to answer, uh, there are myriad questions and I'd love to talk to you about more. But one example is that we see um, in yellow here is the Malawi temperature reconstruction in blue is Tanganyika. There's a huge difference in the response across the deglaciation. What is that about? Okay, so that's one of the questions I'm interested in looking at. 
And then we're gonna also be using the trace single forcing experiments um, with the lake model to try to get at the different impacts uh, of greenhouse gas, ice sheet, and uh, orbital forcing in this work. So just to wrap up, uh, we have this new network of African temperature records. They provide really crucial statistics moving forward of our understanding of African climate sensitivity. Uh, this new proxy system model for Paleo Lake archives uh, helps us uh, generate more robust interpretations of these data, especially across these really key transitions in African climate. We've highlighted the importance of uh, sort of diving a little deeper with our understanding of mixing and seasonality. We see that lake temperatures are damped compared to the input air temperature signal, and there might be some non-stationarity in that relationship. Uh, we also looked at the impact of seasonal biases and were able to confirm uh, previous work suggesting that there's maximum heat uptake by the lake in SON. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, we're gonna have to use all of those different model uh, experiments. PMIP4 is coming up. It'll be exciting to use that new data and see if there's better agreement. And finally, just to leave you with this talk in a nutshell, my <laughs> advisor had this great quote. Is this a models have the wrong equilibrium climate sensitivity thing or a lake thing? And I think we really need to answer that question as a community. So with that, thank you very much. Uh, Lake Tanganyika and most of these large lakes are also a lot affected by wind because there is a large fetch in these lakes. So are you intending to incorporate that? Yes, yeah, so the wind, sorry, the wind speed is um, an input variable to the lake model. So the, the lake energy balance model considers wind speed, uh, humidity, um, pressure, <laughs> temperature, uh, evaporation. And so uh, one of the things that's obviously the wind speeds are much higher in the LGM, so that affects the mixing rate. So yes we can look at the differences in wind speed and try to diagnose, like we can turn wind speed on and off and see exactly how it affects the lake temperatures. So I'm going to present something about Yanga Dryas. This is the, the records on Iberia margin during Yanga Dryas. As you can see, there is a lot of complexities in the hydroclimate uh, results. Uh, some records show that Yanga Dryas uh, has three phases, others two phases, and others a single phase, very dry, for example. Um, a lot of mechanisms have been proposed to explain these changes. Uh, some of them are linked to, the, to changes in, in the Atlantic's uh, meridional circulation. Uh, Others propose that th there is changes in the, in the position and intensity of westerlies, uh, or even both. Uh, the major problem of these uh, records is that most of the times we only have one single uh, proxy, and we don't know exactly what's, what season is, going, is showing us the results. So what we try to do is to um, combine several proxies, independent proxies of hydroclimate in a record here on Iberia, just next to the river, which can uh, facilitate to understand more the hydroclimate on Iberia. And we have compared both marine and terrestrial uh, proxies. We will use pollen, um, terrestrial biomarker, total organic carbon and iron, and on the marine, we have the SST based, uh, uh, determined by Alcanon uh, reconstruction. So as you can see, the only, the, the younger dry is, is, well, well, will, is very well constrained chronologically. So first, I will show you the results in, in terms of temperature, which is quite uh, similar to the Yanga Dryas normally determined on, on the North Atlantic uh, sequences. So here we have plotted, this is the most important, the Mediterranean forest, the trees, and here the SST, and we combine with comparison with the variations on the Amok in intensity from Jerry McManus, and also from Greenland temperatures here. Um, what we can see here, this is the transition, this period is the transition between the Bolling Alorot and Yanga Dryas. 
And we can clear see a decrease on temperatures here, both in the ocean and in the atmosphere. Uh, that follows the, 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 the decrease in temperature in, over Greenland and also the, 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 the gradual decrease on the intensity of the amok. After we have a really cold phase, the most coldest phase of uh, Younger Dryas, well, also well, really well marked on Iberia, on SST, and also on the temperate forest, which reduces, and, uh, and also a reduction of the thermal line circulation. One, one very interesting thing is always, always there, there is a decrease on temperature, there is a decrease also in pine forest. After the, this, this period, we have a, 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 an increase on temperatures, both in the ocean and the atmosphere, at the same time that we have the resumption of the, uh, the Atlantic overturning circulation. And finally, although we have an increased pattern of temperatures from the, the coldest phase here to here, uh, we will see again a slight decrease on temperatures, even if the pattern is in increasing temperatures. Once again, we have a slight reduction on the thermal line circulation and a slight decrease here in pine, reflecting a the slight decrease in temperature in this last phase. So in terms of temperature, everything looks very clear. The problem is when we will discuss about uh, uh, precipitation. So, this is the most complex. We, I will try to to show all what we have. So, here we have the Mediterranean forest. Okay. Then we have semi desert plants here that reflect dry conditions, and then we have heathlands here that might reflect uh, moisture conditions. But since we are in the younger dryas, and normally heathlands doesn't like very contrasting seasonality, so they don't develop so well in these in these cases. Uh, the other terrestrial pro pro uh, proxies that we have uh, are the, the the total organic carbon, the enalkanes, and the iron. As you can see, there is a big big variability along the Yanga Trias with a long term decrease for the entire. Uh, for the entire period. So there are two hypotheses for explaining this terrestrial input. One is linked to dry continental uh, conditions, but this occurs when forest is completely reduced. In contrast, and if we have the system very wet or like extreme storms caused by increasing eastern lines, we can, uh, and we have a, for, a well-developed forest cover, then we can have intense river discharges that will increase this in, uh, terrestrial input. So here, I will show you. As you can see, even if we have a decrease in temperate forest, this is just mo uh, more or less 10%, which is not sufficient to explain uh, deforestation, completely deforestation and, and in terrestrial input by dry conditions. Another thing that we have is a, 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 an immense pine forest, which also prevents the terrestrial input, uh, uh, or it means that it's not so dry. It's impossible to, to, to explain this, um, this transfer with dry conditions. Another interesting issue is that normally, uh, in Poland, normally we we we, th we al always speak about precipitation in summer, but in fact, for example, temperate trees really need for having this the, these percentages. We really need uh, high uh, a high quantity of wet conditions during winter time. Uh, and if you see if there is some changes in sme desert plants. The changes, are, the, the quantity of Smith Desert is not very high. So, so what we think is that, uh, in fact, we can have more dry conditions during summer, 
but extremely wet conditions during winter. And some phases are more wet and some phases are less wet. All of this is controlled by the intensity of the easter lines. So if we compare now our results with a series of other uh, records from, from Europe, we can see this is, uh, I only, I put only the, the uh, this is one cave in northeastern Iberia. Here is a sand dune located not far away from our record. Here we have Lake, the Lake Mar in Germany, and also this lake in Norway. Uh, as you can see, there is a big variability, uh, north-south variability in terms of precipitation. And cytetically, I can show you, for example, for the Bolling Alarod Younger Dries transition, all, all the records from the north are, are detecting just low, lower winter precipitation and uh, slight cooling. Sea ice is still very reduced. On Iberia, on Iberian margin, we have high precipitation, but decreasing a decreasing pattern during this, this phase. Uh, what's happening, we still don't have uh, a sea ice expansion that came uh, after. So we have a low seasonal precipitation contrast during the, that phase. In the second phase, or the, 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 the coldest phase of Younger Dryas, is when we have the sea ice south, southward expansion. We have high winter precipitation in the mid latitudes, but low winter precipitation in the north. Next, we have the recovery of the temperatures, the, the, the warming in the, of the, the second phase of Younger Dryas. And we have a slightly decrease on winter precipitation uh, on Iberia and, and in, in, in Germany, but as, uh, it starts to increase precipitation uh, over Norway. We, and finally, we have moderate winter precipitation on Iberia and in, in Germany, and high winter precipitation on Norway. And finally, this is the last ice sheet retreat, uh, ice sheet, uh, sea ice retreat, sorry. So here we propose these mechanisms to explain. So, uh, so at the first, during the transition, Bolling Alarod Younger Dryas, we have just the mid latitudes westerlies arriving to Iberia. In the second phase, we have the north, uh, the north uh, latitude westerlies that are coming further south, uh, accompanying the sea ice expansion. So we have west westerlies all over this region, Iberia and and me, uh, Central Europe. In the third phase, we have sea ice is starting to, to retreat, and we have less, less intensity of oyster lice, but they persist, they still persist in this region. And finally, in the last, in the last phase, we have most, most of the events, we have the, the oyster lice displaced further north, even if we have probably a storm event during this last phase of Younger Dryas. So as a conclusion, uh, the Younger Dryas hydroclimate is very complex, as the other uh, authors also said. The wettest winters were associated with the driest summers, in particular during sea ice southern lie expansion. The mild winters were associated with relatively less dry conditions, in particular during sea ice retreat or before the expansion of sea ice, and changes in the Ambok had a great impact on temperature pattern over Iberia during the Younger Dryas, while changes in the position and the intensity of westerlies have a great impact on Iberian margin precipitation patterns during winter time. From the beginning, I would like to thank all co-authors for their um, crucial uh, contribution for this paper. And this presentation is very timely since our paper was, was published two days ago in Scientific Report. So the title is Coupling of Equatorial Atlantic Surface Stratification to Glacial Shifting the Tropical Rain Belt. 
So the intertropical convergence zone, the ITCZ, uh, can be defined as a belt of maximum precipitation in the equatorial region, and it is very important for the climate change, uh, for the climate system, since they con it controls the precipitation on the ocean and continents. So today, nowadays, the ITCZ is located uh, north of the equator, uh, most because the energy or heat transference between both hemisphere to uh, ocean and atmosphere uh, system. So, uh, ob ob observational and modeling uh, studies suggest that uh, the ocean transfer uh, 0.4 pentawatts of energy from the south to the north uh, Atlantic through the Atlantic Meridional Overturn Circulation, the AMOC, while the um, atmosphere transfer back to the south around uh, 0.5 pentawatts of energy. So to compensate this asymmetric, the ITCZ is located north of the equator. So uh, these uh, studies, they suggest that in a world with uh, reduced uh, AMOC or this cross-equatorial uh, exchange through the ocean, the ITCZ should be located uh, on the equator or south equator. So it happened in the past during uh, millennial scales uh, paleoclimatic events known as Heimsch events. So the paleoceanograph uh, rec records uh, show that the AMOC was strongly reduced. In response, the ITCZ shift southward. Uh, it is uh, well documented in the South American as a clear antiphase between North uh, South America in Kayako Bay. The, uh, the record shows dry uh, conditions, while in the south, uh, the record showed wet conditions. Yeah. But our question was, uh, what happened? What happened with the oceanic counterpart of the ITCZ? So the, the ITCZ is uh, characterized by the low salinity in the ocean, in the surface ocean, and the freshwater input, they also change the, uh, the density of the water column and create this shallow mixer layer under the ITCZ that we call, uh, that it is the, the Atlantic ITCZ or the oceanic counterpart of the ITCZ. And we know that planktonic foraminifera is very sensitive to the upwater uh, stratification in the equatorial uh, regions, and we look for a new prox using planktonic foraminifera that could be used to trace the Atlantic ITCZ, the position in a modern position and the past position. So we took a look in 407 surface sediment from Margo project, and we noticed that a global, a neo global quadrina duter tray respond very well to the shallow uh, mixer layer. So here in the uh, upper valley zones in Africa and also under the Atlantic ITCZ. So the Duter 3 is absent here in this region because the thermocline, the mixer layer is depth because the, the wind influence. We also notice that uh, Neoglobal Quadrina in Compta also shows uh, this band of high, uh, increased abundance in, under the, ITCZ, uh, the Atlantic ITCZ. And Globigerina glutinata has the uh, opposite behavior, so it is absent here in the upwelling zones of, of Africa and uh, low abundance in, under the Atlantic ITCZ. So we uh, propose a new prox using this uh, uh, ratio among these three species to trace the, the as a prox for the uh, mixed layer depth. So, and we could use to, tra to trace the, the, the Atlantic ITCZ in the past. 
So the small mis uh, mismatch here can be, uh, it is because the surface sediment, they records the Holocene thermal maximum where, when the ITCZ was located north of its modern uh, position. So we applied the, the ratio in, the, in these two cores. So the one from Tobago Basin, the plankton from Minifera assembly was, was uh, published in Hus and Zhang 2000, and we took the Geob uh, 1661 uh, of Northeast Brazil. And so this is the, the, the first F, uh, figure from the, the paper. So this is just to show the close match between the, our Rachel and the, the mixed layer depth. So this is the, our results. So uh, our results shows a clear interface um, uh, between both sides. So in North, uh, Northeast Brazil, we, sh we, we have the increase of the rate of during the highest event, highest, highest state of one, while in, in the Tobago Basin, we have decrease of the, the rate during the same uh, period of time. Here we also um, uh, use plankton from a uh, modern analog uh, technique to reconstruct the subsurface temperature at the 50, uh, 50 meters depth, water depth, use plankton from different, and we also show the antiphase, while uh, Northeast Brazil, the subsurface was cool, indicates the, the shallow uh, mixer layer, in Tobago Bay, the record shows the warming of the subsurface uh, temperature waters and indicate the deep uh, mixed layers uh, in, in Tobago Basin. So this is very um, uh, close match with the reduce of the uh, AMOC, uh, reducing the, uh, the precipitation in Tobago Basin, in Kayako Basin in the north, and also in the increased uh, precipitation in North East, uh, Brazil. To understand the mechanism behind the, the our uh, the mechanism behind, we also apply uh, use the model uh, the atmosphere ocean trace 21 ka simulations that shows uh, anomalies between LGM and the highest stage one. So here in A, we have the fresh water flux. So the, the, the ocean simulations uh, shows positive anomaly in net precipitation of Northeast Brazil and negative in Tobago Basin. So it indicates that the rain belt shift southward, increase the precipitation in this area and decrease precipitation in this area. So in B, we have the mixed layer depth and here the, the, the model shows negative anomalies in mixed layer depth in Northeast Brazil and uh, positive anomalies in Tobago Bay indicate that shallow uh, mixed layer in the interface that support our interpretation that the, the Atlantic ITCZ also shifts southward during the high stages events. Um, so conclusion, we conclude that in the West Tropical Atlantic, the Atlantic ITCZ may have been located south of equator, around one degree south, uh, around uh, five degrees from its modern position. Physical and ecological change in upper water uh, Atlantic follow the southward displacement of the Atlantic ITCZ, and our results also support model hypothesis, hypothesis that the ITCZ uh, shift southward uh, because the reduced cross equatorial, uh, the reduced AMOC heat transport to the North Atlantic. So I would like to thank all uh, the Foundation agents. And I would like to thank a special thank for Pages uh, financial support and 
for your attention. It's just that. I could not check. Uh, what is the amplitude of your temperature change in the mix layer, mix layer in your temperature reconstruction? What is the amplitude of the change? Yeah. It was around, uh, let's see here. Two point five degrees. Oh yeah, around two degrees change. Could you compare that with uh, other results already? Mm, no, we just uh, no, we don't. We we didn't compare. Using your model, do you know which uh, which mechanism is driving which one? Is it the sh southern shift? of the ITZ driving the slowing of the AMOC, or the no, contrary? No, it's opposite. It's the opposite. It's, it's the opposite. Because there are some studies that are showing that the shift uh, of the ITZ is before, actually, the slowing down of the AMOC and other periods uh, during the late quaternary. It's yeah. really preceding, but in your model is the, the opposite. Yeah, the opposite. Sure. So the models suggest that uh, the, the AMOC is very important to uh, for the ITZ position, so the heat transference. So if you reduce this transfer, uh, this, uh, the AMOC, the ITZ should be located south of the equator. And so there are all, uh, many other uh, studies that suggest that they are, they shift together. Okay. But this, this, uh, right. the model shows that the, uh, the AMOC is, the, is important okay. for the, Thank you. That position. I do, would like to thank uh, all of my contributors, contributors, or maybe the collaborators, like especially my supervisor, Stefan Mulisa, Cassandra Casey, and also Matthias, and also other modelers and uh, uh, other Brazilian colleagues, and also from the different research institutes. And uh, to work on this topic, actually, as we already know, on the H1, there is a really significant slowdown of the AMOC. And uh, based uh, on some previous already published results, we already clearly could see that here from H1, the AMOC is significantly slowed down. And also, I don't want to explain why. And also, recent, this morning, I just read some post uh, said. Uh, uh, maybe the potassium turn ratio from the North Atlantic cannot be a practice of the AMOC variation, but then that would be another story. But in my talk, I just uh, you know, used uh, the interpretation, it was already 13 years ago, to uh, state that during the H1, AMOC clearly experienced a slowdown. And based on this, and we already also know that uh, the heat transport by the AMOC, especially here, it showed the red color shows the the warm water and also the cold, uh, blue color showed the cold water with the trans, uh, uh, let's say the movement of the AMOC, you know, the heat warming and also the salty water can be transported from the tropical Atlantic until the North Atlantic and then there, the heat will be released and which could uh, just uh, affect the European climate. But for my talk, I'll just focus on the South America and uh, if the AMOC slow, uh, if the AMOC is reduced in the past, so what will happen? I mean the climate in South America. And then to work on this, and of, of course, we need to know the mechanism because before, normally a lot of the study just showed the, let's say the South America climate was, let's say, closely rela related to the North Atlantic climate forcing, or maybe the fresh water based on the model simulation, or maybe based on the other study. But, uh, here we need to, uh, we, what I did is just uh, I compiled all the published record to double check the general pattern of the rainfall change or maybe the parallel moisture change over the South America during the H1, of course compared to the LGM. And uh, we don't interpret the practice anymore, but we just uh, evaluate the, uh, the age model of the each record. Here is the result which I used we just use uh, some kind of the index to evaluate uh, the chronology of the each record, and also here's uh, some kind of data, because uh, here, normally we think the CRI value, if it was more than one, I, um, means this 
pilot recorder should be more reliable than the CR value with, uh, which was lower than one. And in total, as I already marked here, we have 32 record with uh, CR value more than one. And also here, next picture, I'll just show the general pattern based on our compilation. And based on this picture, we could clearly see the general pattern over the Andes here during the century one, it was whiter than the LGM, but for the north part of the South America, although there was only a few records, it showed a drier condition, but, and also the, over the northeast of Brazil, it showed a wetter condition, but uh, uh, in the southeast of Brazil, it also a little bit wetter, but in the central part, especially the lowland Amazon, here, there are not so many published records so far. And uh, to interpret uh, the mechanism, or maybe to figure out the mechanism behind, we just, uh, yeah, exactly, this, oh, sorry, I already asked this question before. And uh, what was the mechanism leading the such pattern of the parallel hydraulic change during Hinge 1? Because recently we know, based on the modern metallurgy's uh, data, we know that here it was, I just showed the rainfall variation over the South America during the summer season, of course, in South America, and here, this green line shows the South uh, Atlantic low level jet, which could transport a lot of the moisture from the tropical Atlantic towards the Andes. Then this moisture will be reflected by the Andes along the Andes, along this way, along to, let's say, towards the southeast. And then from here, very likely it will, it will also to, some, somehow it will could reach the southeast of Brazil. And also over the southeast of Brazil here, it will another. Uh, let's say the atmosphere circulation named uh, South Atlantic Convergencing Zone, which would transport some uh, moisture from the least place to the lowland of Amazon. And uh, because of that, a lot of, of the, or maybe especially the sp some spelled term record, or maybe other records, they, uh, they plan, let's say they interpret to such kind of the weight condition along the Andes uh, could be related to the stronger monsoon. Yeah, this is actually already, they say, uh, for a really long time, but to, by which mechanism, we don't know, because as I already showed, oh, sorry. In this study, we just uh, used, uh, let's say, used uh, some sensitive experiment to check what exactly is the forcing exactly of such kind of, the, uh, especially the general pattern of the palo uh, rainfall change. And uh, as uh, I already mentioned before, normally we think it was a Atlantic forcing. And uh, based on the result, of course, we uh, just run, first we run the uh, fresh water hose experiment uh, of the LGM boundary condition. And uh, here is the result. And also we could find some kind of cooling over the north and also warming in the south. I, don't, uh, I will not explain in details about the model stuff, but. Uh, Later on, I'll just show our result. And also to work on our, let's say, to work on our first research question, we just, let's say, forced the Atlantic SST variation in the model. It's the first, first experiment, ex, experiment. And the second one, we also forced the uh, Eastern Pacific SST variation in our model. And then just uh, we combined them together to force the model, and then also compare the results with the global SST experiment to see what exactly is, uh, should be the trigger of the, such a pattern. And uh, our results show that if we consider both the Atlantic and also the Eastern Pacific var uh, SST variation, the model result could capture almost the general pattern of the, uh, let's say, compared to the global SST experiment. But if we only consider Atlantic or maybe the Eastern Pacific, we could only, let's say, reach a part of the general pattern of the rainfall change over the South America. Based on our model result, we could say, okay, this kind of the general pattern, which was already uh, showed by the panel record, could be, let's say, could be triggered by both the Atlantic and also the Eastern Pacific SST variation. This was our first uh, conclusion. And uh, of course, in this work, we didn't mention too much about the ITC shift because ITC shift was already quite clear. And uh, here, we only focused on 
or maybe mainly focused on the general pattern uh, along the Andes, uh, I mean such kind of the wetter condition along the Andes. But uh, of course, if we consider Andes was a really large region, at least our work mainly focused on the, from the more or less around the equator to central Andes because south, south part of the Andes was quite uh, complicated. We, we, and I will just leave this, uh, go, let's say, question open, probably, like, like telling you guys or ask them some question. And the best on this result, we still, uh, let's say, work on the second one, and also was a reversal of the North, uh, Brazilian current as suggested by some model, because uh, as I already showed before, the North Brazilian current then was an ocean current system uh, along the continent, along the, let's say, the North uh, Brazilian margin, which would transport a lot of the warm water towards the north. But in some models showed that it was very likely this kind of current will be reversed. And of course, then, then five or maybe 10, let's say six years ago, it was a really coarse model, but uh, recently, especially last year, I made uh, the modelers uh, and the ICP conference with a really high resolution model, which is still reversed in the model. But we, based, uh, uh, let's say, to check it, to check whether it was worst or not, we just work on the proxy data. And uh, to do this, of course, here. Yeah, here it was done just uh, some explanation in details about for the reverse of the North East uh, North Brazilian current here. Because normal, in modern days, the current will just transport a lot of the warm water from in this direction towards the Caribbean Sea, only towards the north. And uh, some model results showed that it was very likely to be reversed. And uh, to work on this, or maybe first I, I should uh, let's say explain why we uh, have great interest on working on this. Because first, uh, yeah, because the North Brazilian current could transport a lot of the Amazon sediment along the continent margin of French Guinea until around uh, 10 degrees or more. That means 200 million tons per kilo year, per year. That was too much. That was quite much. If the, such kind of the current reverse in the past, that means like least in the, like least condition. So such kind of sediment will be transported to uh, in another direction, in you know, opposite direction, then deposited along the continent margin of the northeast of Brazil. That means if it happened in the past, a lot of the paddle record from this area, especially from the northeast of Brazilian continent margin, might, might be something wrong. We need to double check. And uh, yeah, especially here, I just compared the really second largest river in the northeast east of Brazil, named the Parnaiba, because compared to the Amazon River, this river, if we consider all the sediment from this river drainage basin can be deposited along the continent margin, just along the river mouth, it was only five million tons per year. Compared to 200, it was just a, a different level. And to work on this topic, of course, uh, we compiled the published uh, and also some newly recall, uh, re retrieved sediment core over the tropical western Atlantic. First, to see the sedimentation rate, as I already mentioned before. If such kind of the current reverse, definitely the sedimentation rate should also increase, extremely increase. And uh, based on our results during the LGM, here it was a general pattern, almost we could see and uh, more or less to the northwest of the Amazon River here, it uh, was a re really high sedimentation rate site. But uh, during the French one, and this river mouth, we named the Parnaiba, it also has a really high sedimentation rate. And also based on the sedimentation rate, um, and to, let's say if we only consider sedimentation rate, it's quite hard to answer whether the North uh, Brazilian current was reversed or not. So, to, conf to still work, or maybe to further work on this uh, research question, we just measured the strontium and neodymium data of these two core, especially these two high sedimentation rate core. One is just here, and also another one is just here. And uh, here, I just marked the, at least two sediment core as one, and also two. Here is a core ID. We could just uh, use a short name, 202, and also 206, to reprint them and uh, to, let's say, compare or maybe to trans the sediment uh, source of this 
uh, at least two core sites. Of course, we also uh, collected a lot of the published modern sediment, I mean, for the Stronson and Medium data along the diff in the different uh, tributary of the Amazon River, and also we mirrored a lot of the modern sediment for the Stronson and Medium data in the Panaiba Basin, and also some uh, surface sediment along the continent margin of Brazil. And from the, let's say, from the Panaiba River mouth until the Amazon River mouth, and until the, con let's say, the continent uh, here at this point, uh, just off of the French Guinea, the result was quite promising, actually, because these two core, 224 and also 206, both are well dated by the radio carbon age. And also in, let's say, over the past 30,000 years, we could see the new dream data didn't change too much if we just look at them respectively, especially for the core 224, the new dream data was more or less around the minus 11.5, but for the core 26, the new dream data was more or less around the mi minus 17, plus or maybe minus uh, 0.5. And yeah, based on this new dream data, we could uh, almost be sure, or maybe quite sure, the sediment at least from the, and the Pineapple River mouth is not from the Amazon basin. If that, Okay, here I also, sorry, uh, I will just go back. If that, very likely the North Brazilian current was not reversed during the 101, and uh, by also comparing the other strontium and medium data from the Amazon basin, here we further could see, okay, the core 224, here is all the data of the core 224. It was quite comparable with the data from the Amazon basin, although it was from which, uh, which tributary, tributary, we don't know, but mostly from the Andes, because another PhD student here recently uh, is working on the, uh, some kind of sam samples from the Andes. And but for, so for the core 206 here, we could see it was quite uh, consistent with the modern sediment from the Panama Basin, because here, actually, we include more or less around 49 samples, but uh, we just use the average to show that the range. And uh, based on this, we could uh, say, okay, first, first the North Brazilian current was not reversed, and also second, the sediment and the Panama River mouth is very likely just uh, uh, from the local region, like the Panama drainage basin. That means, uh, as I told before, the interpretation of all the pilot record from the Northeast Brazilian continent margin was correct, not wrong. Yeah, and as we already see here. And uh, here, based on our conclusion here, I also showed some geochemistry data of the last two core, especially for the core 206. We could see almost during the cold periods like younger joys and also hence to one and also hence two. Here it, it has some kind of increase in the iron castle ratio and also the sedimentation rate and also other ratios like uh, the uh, aluminum and silicon ratio and also this ratio because we, uh, let's say, also interpret the mechanism behind, I mean the increase of those kind of the geochemical proxies of the core 226, but for the core 24, we, could, we couldn't see such kind of the really, let's say, large variation of all kind of the proxies here because and so then the moment so we just measured a lot of the, especially the uh, geochemical data are like uh, iron and castle ratio by two centimeter. And uh, recently we just got the data of five millimeter and other really high resolution data. But, and we also found some interesting thing of this core and also submit a manuscript to a journal. It was, it's under review. And uh, my talk is here and also I will just, uh, you know, stress out the tech home message Yang first. Sheng, uh, we're going to have to move on. We're running oh, over time, I'm afraid. Okay. Uh, the tech home message would be first. Uh, of course, Atlantic uh, ST variation led to the ITCZ shift towards the south. And uh, beside Pacific ST variation, especially the eastern part of, of the Pacific ST variation, are uh, really important to induce or maybe to increase the rainfall along the Amazonia Andes. And the second, the simulated reversal of the North, Bra uh, North Brazilian current. Now, it was very unlikely reversed during the H1. And uh, based on the 
our concurrent, we could further confirm the increased input of the sediment of offshore northeast Brazil was just from the, let's say, due to the really extremely increased uh, precipitation over this region due to the ITCZ shift towards the south during the Hench one. And uh, then I'm done. I will just take the question. I don't have time for questions, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> so what I want to talk about uh, today is, you know, we've heard a lot over the course of the past few lectures uh, on the um, uh, comparing models and um, observations in terms of paleo uh, precipitation uh, records. But what I want to do is try to take a, take a bit of a step back and ask the question of just saying, you know, how much do we believe or how, how much confidence can we give to uh, climate models? And I guess I'm always um, aware of this picture here from, um, well, this was 2007 IPCC report showing you the predicted changes of climate. Um, and the key thing I want to highlight is that the, the, the stippled area shows you where w the modelers have some confidence, i.e. that the, the, the model results are, are consistent among different models. The temperature got a lot of confidence. For precipitation, you can see that there are actually only a few regions, actually, which are stippled. There's a lot of uncertainty when it comes to modeling um, precipitation. Now, now, I have to admit that you can use different metrics which can improve that figure, but bo by, bottom line is models are much more uncertain when it comes to precipitation than it, t t than it is with, with temperature. And one of the classic reasons for why that is, is, is people talk about the, the spatial scale, that precipitation is generally occurring on much smaller scales than, than, than the temperature signal. And so the hope is that sort of by, as we increase the, the resolution of climate models, we might hope that we might get a better, better um, uh, result. And this is showing you the sort of uh, evolution of resolutions of climate models um, the, in the 2013 report, I, I, I highlighted the word maximum here. In fact, it, t it really is maximum in the sense of saying I think only one or maybe two models out of the CMIP five actually had that resolution. Most were, were, mo most were lower resolution. But nonetheless, resolution has been increasing. What impact does that have on precipitation? And in particular, what impact does that have on paleo precipitation uh, simulations? And so that's really the question I'm going to kind of pose. Does, does precipitate resolution make, make, make a difference? And so I'm going to do, uh, show you results from a set of uh, simulations um, with the Hadley Center Climate Model, um, HADM3 uh, in this case. And I'm going to use four different resolutions for the talk. In, in my abstract talked about having six resolutions, but th and that was, my abstract was written six months ago uh, when there was a, we were getting a new supercomputer at Bristol any day. Well, in fact, we have problems, and, and the supercomputer only started working on Friday. Um, and these simulations take more than a weekend to run. So, um, we, so we're, we're confined, unfortunately, just to four uh, simulations here. The key thing, you know, I chose the Hadley Center Model A because I like using it, and it's just my model, I like playing with it. Um, but a second and very important aspect, I think, in terms of these, these runs, is although the, the Hadley Center Model is, is sort of uh, well-renowned, or this is, um, and this, this is the sort of typical resolution that it's used, the Hadley Center model is also has another name. It's often sometimes referred to as the unified model. And the unified model means that it's basically the same code base that they use for climate prediction and weather prediction. Now, the model is old, and so it's not the latest um, weather prediction model. But at the time that Hadley M3 was developed, this was their weather, res weather resolution model. And so the key thing here is that that means that there's been a lot of work in terms of model development to make sure that it works at both resolutions. It's not that you're going from a standard model and then just sort of hand-waving and just shoot running the model at high resolution. There's been a lot of work done, done in terms of making sure that it works at both resolutions. And so basically, I'm going to take these four resolutions. I'm going to do, well, I'm going to do a pre-industrial simulation. I've put in gray mid-Holocene because I just don't have time. You, will, you won't get to lunch if I, I talked about mid-Holocene runs. So I'm just going to focus in on the LGM. Um, PMIT4 boundary conditions. Um, and because it's an atmosphere-only model, I'm going to use sea surface temperature and sea ice changes from um, a PMIT4 had CM3 run that we've done. So to give you an idea of what does resolution do, I just thought I'd show you a few standard sort of pictures. Back of the audience, or if you're tired and your eyes are not focused, hard to spot the difference, actually, at, at, uh, when you look at the sort of on the global scale in terms of the different land sea masts that go into this model. This is just showing you the present day configuration. So I'm going to zoom up just on Europe just to highlight, um, uh, just to give you a really insight in terms of how the resolutions are changing. 
So you can see the low resolution model on the, t on, on the uh, top left here. Um, oh, I wish my model was like, uh, or at least reality was like our model because um, the U UK is nicely joined to Europe. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> as we go up in resolution, so this gets one step, next step, and we can't, uh, eventually we have Brexit uh, occurring. And, and, and you can see the UK, for instance, is, is no longer attached. But you can get an idea. You can see that the model is doing a much better job in some senses in terms of representing the coastlines there. And inevitably, it also does a much better job at representing the mountains. Again, if I showed you the global pictures, it would be hard put to tell the difference. But if you look at it locally, you can see that, um, again, the coarse resolution model, you, you can barely get, you're vaguely seeing the Alps and the Pyrenees. But by the time you get to this high resolution, you're really getting a lot of detail in terms of the... Um, aerography. So, so those are the sort of benefits of going to the high, or one benefits of going to high resolution. So what do we get as a result? And I thought I'd start off be, by showing you a, free, a, a pretty picture. Um, uh, high resolution modelers always love to show pretty pictures. You're meant to, at this stage, say, oh, wow, isn't it lovely, that picture on the right? Um, because of the detail that you're seeing there, the streamers of, of, of precipitation. If I showed you a, a satellite images of sort of cloud cover and compared it to these models, it'd be, it would really begin to be hard to, put to tell the difference between the two. So it's a really nice, in one sense, it's a nice looking model. But, 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 but you shouldn't really sort of um, just go for beauty or whatever. You should look hard. And I, I want to highlight three features, because there's three features that, even though it's just eyeballing these results, it basically summarizes the, the, the results I'm going sh to show you, or some issues anyway. First issue is that you can see there's a, a beat there. It's bouncing up and down uh, on a regular... Uh, that's not me doing my dad dancing. Um, but that is just a diurnal cycle. And in the tropics in particular, you can see a very strong diurnal cycle. And all models, whether they're low resolution or models or high resolution models, and not just the Hadley Center model, do a pretty bad job at the diurnal cycle in the tropics. It's too regular. You can see it really is just bouncing along. Every day you have thunderstorms breaking out. And in fact, if you do a detailed analysis, you'd find they um, are um, at the wrong time of day as well. So, so basically, um, it's, you, you can see them, but that's not a particularly good feature. There are other features which I'll let you uh, try and uh, track. Oh, there's one there. The high-resolution model is getting you more extremes, particularly in terms of the tropics. And one of the reasons I've been developing this high-resolution model is I want to look at tropical storms and typhoons and things like that to look to see how, wh what changes are going on in, pe in the paleo record. But the final point I want to make is that if you look at the high mid latitudes of either hemisphere, in one sense, yes, it's a much prettier picture here, but I, I think my first impression, whenever I look at it, is it's just, in one sense, how similar these two are. There's a little bit more extreme precipitation here, but the basic processes are, um, basic phenomena are, are, are very similar between the two, and that's the basic story of the results, basically of saying in the tropics, yes, you're getting some new features appearing, uh, because you're getting new phenomena that you can resolve. But in mid-latitudes, actually, no, you're, you're resolving some features uh, just better, but, but the basic phenomena are there even at the coarse resolution models. So let's look at the results. We've got to go very quickly. This is just for the pre-industrial simulation. What I'm showing you is the four different resolutions and in the middle of the observations. I've not got time to show you the, the differences, but the, at, again, at the, the, the scale of the global scale, the, the, the model biases are remarkably constant with resolution. There's very, very little difference. What you can see is the benefit if you go to um, uh, zoom up again. So I'm zooming up on Europe. And what you can see here is, a, again, not surprisingly, at the coarse resolution model, I always like pointing out the fact that in my coarse resolution model, um, sort of southwest France has the same rain, rainfall as Bergen, and I think anybody who's been to both places know that that's not quite right. Um, but if you look at the high resolution model, you're now getting much, much better details of the, the paleogeography and also the coastlines, it has to be said, the sort of um, and the details there. So let's go to now the headline results or the, um, in terms of what does resolution then do for our last glacial maximum simulations. And so what I'm showing you here is now the simulated model differences. So it's the, the change, the last glacial maximum pr minus pre-industrial, low resolution, gradually up to the high resolution um, model. And again, on the whole, I think uh, you'd, agree, uh, you'd agree with me that there's a remarkable similarity. It's not changing the results very much at all. That there are regions um, where you can see, you know, there's a lot of orange around, so in, there's a lot of dry conditions. 
Um, but by and large, it's very, very similar. If you compare the model to uh, 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 some of the observations, particularly I uh, um, looked at the um, Pat Bartline's um, reconstructions of um, the, the pollen, what you can see is that, for instance, the, the, the model is doing um, the pollen record is, uh, argues for a wetter uh, North America, particularly the uh, Western North America, and all the models get that. Um, what is interesting, in fact, um, after the uh, talk earlier on in terms of the North American monsoon, I had a quick look at our simulations. I'm showing you here the annual mean, but if I looked at the June, July, August um, results, then I do actually get a drying of the, um, the North American monsoon, but I get an increase in uh, winter rainfall, so it pretty much cancels out in there. There is one difference in terms of North America that you can note is that it's actually drier to on the, the eastern side of North America, and that actually agrees with the pollen record, whereas the low-resolution model doesn't. And initially, I thought that that was kind of chance, um, but a further digging down, actually, is that that change there is actually very much related to the sharpening of storm tracks uh, 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 going across North America, and I think that is a resolution-dependent result. So uh, uh, it has improved the simulation somewhat in, in, in North America. Um, if you zoom up again on Europe, you can see the benefits now of resolution. So the big scale picture is that resolution doesn't have much effect um, on our simulations. So it's not going to be a magic wand that we can suddenly say, oh, uh, some of our big systematic errors are going to disappear. But it does have some big impacts in terms of the local precipitation. And this comes back to a lot of the talks that we heard, heard about in terms of the uh, comparing models and observations is that this is now showing you, as I say, the European changes. And you can see that as you go through the resolutions, you get sort of, again, lots sharper features. And in particular, for instance, you can see here that um, once you go to high resolution, you can see a really, really strong rain shadow effect occurring because over the um, Alps. And that is basically because the prevailing wind direction changes, and that changes the, the location of the, um, the, the, the rain shadow of, uh, um, uh, uh, thing. So you get a drawing there. Um, and it actually even improves, the, the, the data is a bit ambiguous in terms of Iberia, it's, but generally is arguing for a drying uh, conditions. But if you look closely at the sites that you've got pollen, then in fact, again, the high resolution is an improvement over the low resolution. So at the fine detail, you're getting improvements. Big picture, no. Yeah. So is there any benefits of, um, uh, other benefits of resolu resolution? And, and I just want to very, very briefly now go over and just, uh, just flick through these slides very, very quickly and just say that there is a big difference in terms of modeling extremes. So this is showing you the present day simulations um, in terms of heavy rainfall. It also is true for rainy days and there's improvements in the rainy day simulations and the hatching is the high resolution model and you can see we're getting more um, changes in extremes and the distribution changes when you go to the LGM. And what's in particularly interesting is that the LGM um, for our high resolution model, although there's actually a, a decrease in, 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 in rainfall in um, overall, the, the extremes haven't actually changed. In fact, in, in this simulation, all the, the, the extremes have actually increased. And I think that could be really important, particularly when it comes to um, the, the, the modeling of um, the, the, the proxies, where these distributions may really be actually very important to interpreting the results. And with that, I better finish and get, let you get on to lunch. As I say, Main story is, quite simply, big picture, we're not seeing much difference, um, but you are getting some details, um, improvements around the Alps, and it, there's some really, I think, exciting things to be done in terms of really paleo tempestology, paleo storms, um, where the high resolution model can say a lot more. And with that, I thank you. So my question is, in your experimental design, why you didn't scale the uh, number of vertical levels along with the amount of horizontal grid points, given that precipitation involves resolution vertically? Yes, I, 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 I did think about that. Technically, it's much harder to change vertical um, resolution because that does have a, often quite a big impact on things like cloud cover and how you handle clouds. So I deliberately chose 30. That's actually a higher resolution than the normal coarse resolution model. And, and so I was hoping, if in some senses, that the 30 levels is a little bit better tailored towards a high resolution, and it probably doesn't have um, a, a big difference at the low resolution. But you're right to say that I should probably also investigate that, but it's a much tougher problem. <laughs>